Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar about strip search law and practice in New South Wales and the class action investigation currently being undertaken by Redfern Legal Centre and Slater and Gordon. My name is Alexis Goodstone and I'm the Principal Solicitor of Redfern Legal Centre. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands upon which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I would also like to welcome any Aboriginal people that have joined us here today. I come to you from Maroubra, which means place of thunder in the local Aboriginal language. Now, I would like to introduce uh, the panel and give you an idea of what we're going to cover today. So Samantha Lee is the Police Accountability Solicitor at Redfern Legal Centre. Um, she has experience advising and acting for clients who have been strip searched, as well as subject to other police powers, and will speak about current strip search law. When can police strip search you and what are the safeguards? David Shoebridge is a Greens MP and the founder with the Young Greens of the anti-drug dog page Sniffoff. As the Justice Spokesperson for the Greens, New South Wales, he works on issues including over-policing of First Nations communities, police accountability, civil liberties and the right to protest. He will speak today about some of the data he has obtained about strip searches and other coercive police powers, as well as the move for law reform within the New South Wales Parliament. Ebony Birchall is a senior associate and class action specialist at Slater and Gordon and will be speaking about the strip search class action investigation being undertaken with Redfern Legal Centre and explain the registration and investigation process. So we are recording this webinar and also streaming it live on Facebook. Attendees in the Zoom webinar can post questions using the Q&A function and attendees watching via Facebook can post questions in the comments. We will have a Q&A session during the last 15 minutes, which I, and I will put the best questions to the panelists. Please keep your questions brief, ideally one sentence ending with a question mark, or I may not be able to use it. So I think that's all I have to say. So please let me hand you over to Samantha Lee. Uh, thank you, Alexis, and uh, welcome everyone. I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, which is the land that I am on, uh, from the Aura Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. So today I hope to, for you to go away with an understanding of your rights regarding strip searches and what the law is about, also for you to understand the problems with strip search law and why a class action may be able to assist with addressing some of those problems. So let's just get straight into it and uh, look at strip search law or, or laws in general regarding searches. So do police have the power to search a person? Well, yes, there is a general power to search an individual, but it just can't occur randomly. That power is outlined in an act of usually known as LEPRA or the Law Enforcement Powers and Responsibilities Act. The power to search, the one used most widely, is uh, Section 21 of that Act, and that allows police to stop, search and detain someone, but only to undertake those powers if they form the state of mind of what's called reasonable suspicion. Now, they also they must suspect that a person has something unlawful on them, uh, that ha they are about to uh, use something to commit an offence or have committed an offence. Uh, they may have a weapon, suspected weapon on them, or the usual one is that they have a suspicion of uh, drug possession on them. So how do police form reasonable suspicion? Well, it can't be just plucked out of the uh, air. It does need to be based on some kind of fact. Uh, there, unfortunately, the legislation does not define what reasonable sorry, suspicion is, uh, uh, but we have to go to the case law to understand that. 
What we do know from case law is that a detection dog, when that comes up to you, that does not by itself constitute reasonable suspicion on its own. So if a drug dog has come up and indicated or sat down next to you, that by itself does not give police powers to then search you. What it does is that it gives police uh, a way in to ask you further questions to then establish whether they can then conduct a search on you. Other things by themselves do not constitute reasonable suspicion is if you're just out at night, uh, early in the morning, the time of day or the location, that in itself does not constitute reasonable suspicion. I can't get that word out today. Uh, not uh, avoiding eye contact, being nervous. Uh, those two don't uh, get you uh, police across the line in regards to reasonable suspicion. Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay, so uh, what a general search does involve and what police can do is that they can ask you to open your mouth. They can't open your mouth for you. They can ask you to shake your hair. Uh, they, can't, they can touch the outer clothing. Uh, they can ask you to remove your coat, jacket or uh, hat, gloves or socks. Uh, so all of that constitutes what we call general or a personal search. But what actually is a strip search? Well, a strip search is something quite different. Uh, it can involve the removal of clothing, but not necessarily. It is meant to be only a visual examination of the person's body, and they're not allowed to touch a person's body. And it's not allowed to involve a cavity search. I'll get into that a bit more later. It can involve, uh, for example, a police officer coming up to you and uh, then pulling out the back of your pants and looking down into your underwear. It can also involve a police officer looking down uh, your top into your bra or breast area. It could involve them asking you to take off your T-shirt or, or top. Uh, it also could involve them asking you to take off all of your clothing. Uh, but as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, them asking you to take off all of your clothing. But if any of what I've just described has happened to you, then you have been uh, strip searched and you should contact us and uh, consider registering for the class action. So who can conduct a strip search? Well, a strip search uh, can be conducted by a police officer. It can't be conducted by a security officer. Uh, security officers have very limited powers and they don't have the power to strip search. So can police conduct a strip search whenever they stop someone or whenever they want? Well, the answer to that is no. To conduct a strip search, police must meet legal thresholds uh, in order to justify that a strip search uh, is necessary. And those thresholds mean that they must uh, justify that a strip search is not only necessary, but the circumstances are serious and urgent enough to make a strip search necessary. So they have to meet that threshold of serious and urgent. Now, unfortunately, the legislation does not define what is serious and urgent. So we have to turn to things like uh, case law and the parliamentary second reading speech. And what we do know is that serious and urgent has to be something fairly serious. For example, an imminent threat to life or safety, then that might meet the threshold of serious and urgent. But what we are, are, are of the view is that suspicion, I don't know why I can't get that word out today, of minor drug uh, possession is not in itself, does not meet that legal threshold of serious and urgent. And we are of the view that if someone has been 
strip searched for minor drug possession, then that strip search uh, may have been unlawful. And we're asking for people that have been strip searched for minor drug possession to come forward and register their interest in a class action, which will be talked about soon by Ebony. So can police strip search a cavity? Well, no, the law clearly defines that police cannot strip search a cavity area. But we do know that police have asked uh, many individuals to squat, cough or bend over. Now, the reason why they do that is to search a cavity. And for that reason, we are of the view that that type of practice also may be unlawful. And if you, you have been subjected to a uh, police officer asking you to squat, cough or bend over, then again, I uh, advise you to consider registering for the class action that we're going to uh, talk about here today. So can police, uh, and, and something I need to emphasise there is that a strip search is a visual inspection only. Uh, police cannot touch your body. Uh, police have also asked uh, individuals to, for example, uh, move breasts or testicles. We also argue that that type of practice is not according to law, is not specified in the law and also may be unlawful. So can police strip search children? Well, yes, they can strip search children. Uh, however, the law does say that they can't strip search children under the age of 10, but they can strip search children from 10 years uh, to 17 uh, and 18 years. Uh, the law does have some safeguards. They are meant to contact a parent or guardian uh, and not strip search a child until that parent or guardian or support person is present. However, there is an opt-out clause within the legislation that allows police to go do away with that whole obligation if they are of the view that evidence may be destroyed or there is a concern for safety. Now, this is really alarming that police can conduct a strip search uh, to a child as young as, as 10. Uh, as I always say, that this fails to adhere to any form of child protection principle. Uh, it is ha a harmful process and should not continue. Even for police, it puts them or exposes them by putting them in a situation where they have authorised a child as young as 10 to take off all of their clothing uh, in a strange environment, in a, a room where there is only an adult and a young child naked present. There are some safeguards present in the legislation in regards to adults as well. Uh, police need to inform an adult the reasons for the search. They should give the person their name and the place where they work. They should also conduct a strip search in a private area, but unfortunately the legislation does not define what a private area is. They are meant to conduct the least evasive search and the person is uh, only to be strip searched by someone of the same sex as the person being subject to the search. There are other safeguards, but I don't have time to go into them all now. Uh, there is a fact sheet on our website uh, at Redfern Legal Centre about strip searches, and I advise people to go in and download that fact sheet. So just to summarise, what are the main problems with the law? Well, the law allows children as young as 10 to be strip searched in New South Wales. Uh, the law does not define what is serious and urgent and uh, police are routinely strip searching on the basis of minor drug possession, which is never, we are of the view, was never the intention of the legislation. Uh, 
the uh, law needs to clearly state that squatting, coughing and bending over is not lawful and is formed part of a cavity search and police must clearly uh, record when a strip search is being undertaken. Uh, information coming out of the police watchdog indicate that the number of strip searches probably haven't been properly recorded uh, and that there is probably maybe double the number of strip searches uh, that have been conducted by police uh, that have not formed part of the stats. And it's really important that we get proper uh, data about the level of strip searches going on in the community. So just to sum up, strip searches uh, should only occur in the most exceptional of circumstances. Unfortunately, they're occurring routinely and we're of the view that the majority of searches uh, conducted by police have probably been unlawful. And if you've been uh, subjected to a strip search, uh, then you should look at registering your interest in the class action. Uh, thanks, Alexis. Now I'd like to hand you over to David Shubridge. Uh, thanks very much, um, Alexis. Um, and thanks, Sam, for that um, extraordinarily thorough um, uh, coverage of the law in relation to strip searches. Uh, the more questions you ask about the law, the more you realise how cooked the law actually is on strip searches. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking today um, from Gadigal land um, and pay my respects to those elders past, present and amusing uh, and, 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 um, and, and arising. And, I do want to acknowledge that actually I'm talking here from Parliament and in my view, the institution that I'm a part of, the New South Wales Parliament, has been a key part of that ongoing oppression of First Nations peoples and indeed is the instrument that has created a lot of the mess we're talking about today because these laws have been made in the institution I'm a part of and um, I acknowledge that even if you're in it trying to change it, you do have a degree of complicity in being part of an institution like the Parliament. Um, so I wanted to just run through a, um, a, a, a short presentation. Um, and, and in order to do that, I'll, I'll try and share the screen and get us started. And the question, the question that I, I wanted to start with is, does New South Wales have a strip search problem? Um, and, you know, I'm kind of tempted when I do these presentations to kind of stop there because the answer is yes, New South Wales, um, through both the legislation created by the parliament um, and also through the behaviour of the New South Wales police, um, does have a distinct problem with strip searches. Um, and, and I'll just take you through um, some of the data that, that, that informs our, our conclusions. And, I apologise for a little bit of the format in here. It's gone a little bit askew, but I, I just bear with me. So um, I think one of the first places to start is just have a look at the actual numbers. Um, what are the total strip searches that the police um, say themselves they have undertaken for any reason? And you can see here um, that between financial year 2015, there are about the police admit to doing 3,700 odd strip searches. And then if you work your way through to financial year 2018, financial year 2019, we're up at 5,400 strip searches a year. And as Sam pointed out, um, what's become clear from the evidence before the series of inquiries before the Law Enforcement Conduct Commission is that the official police numbers that we've got, and, and these are numbers that have come either from Gipper applications or freedom of information applications from my office to the New South Wales Police, um, or they've come about through answers to questions on notice in Parliament to the New South Wales Police. What is pretty clear is that the numbers you see here, the thousands and thousands of strip searches you see here are almost certainly a very substantial understatement because um, uh, there, are, there are an unknown but very, very large number of strip searches that are either uh, the police don't acknowledge or a strip search. That's where they're partially removing the clothing from people. Um, um, or they just simply don't record the search at all. No records at all. So there's a lot there, but the real problem is almost certainly, you know, a substantial 
um, a substantial number over and above that. Um, but what those figures show is a 40%, 46% increase in strip searches across just that four year so, um, cycle. Um, and, and we're not manipulating this data because if you go back, actually the numbers dwindle um, further back. We haven't picked a, 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 a period simply to, to, to match our argument. The, the argument gets better the further back you go in terms of strip searches. It really has escalated in the last four to five years. Um, so uh, uh, when we're looking at strip searches, I think one of the things um, that's, that's really fascinating is, did they actually work? Um, and if you can read through that rather um, curious formatting um, that, that we've got there, um, we can actually go down to the base numbers. And this is what we call the false positive rate. Um, and so the false positives is where somebody has um, had an initial search almost always, nothing's found. Um, and then the police have decided to escalate it to a strip search. And as Sam points out, the rationale and the reasoning under which the police operate to escalate something to a strip search is very opaque. You know, uh, the, the, the concept of necessary uh, and urgent, um, there is, there's no guidance for the police about what is necessary and urgent. Um, and, um, and so in many cases, and, and we've seen this again from evidence before the inquiries in the Law Enforcement Conduct Commission, in many cases, the police just think that they've missed something with the first search. They don't like the look of you. They think you're a young person at a music festival. Uh, um, and they think for that reason, they're just going to escalate it to a strip search. It's pretty clear most general duties police and even their senior officers have no idea about the law. And so they do a strip search because they don't find anything with the first search. So do they find anything? Well, what this data says is no. Um, in you know two thirds or more of the cases, when the police decide to um, escalate to a strip search, they're actually finding nothing. Um, and, and the degree of intrusion and humiliation that individuals are subject to um, in order for in the two thirds of the time for nothing to be found, um, really for me shows just how to, how to whack the law and civil liberties have become and the practice of police and civil liberties. And, and of course, more often than not, when you look at the data, what's found is an amount of drugs, and this is almost all for drugs. The police have tried to say they use strip searches for knife crime. I think about a fraction of a fraction of a percent um, of strip searches are, are for, not for knife crime. Um, but what, the, um, uh, what we do find is they find next to nothing. So, um, uh, so, so having, having Having worked out we've got a problem, having seen the scale of the problem and having realised that strip searches um, really achieve nothing, well, why are they happening? And, and this has been a question that has been asked repeatedly. And so, so one of the things we, we had a whisper actually from within the police, um, a series of whispers that there became a bit of a roar coming from within inside police who, who were saying to us quietly off the record, we're doing this because we have to. We've got these targets. We've got these targets that we have to meet at a local area, you know, in a police station, as we go out and do a search, we don't want to do this, but if we don't meet the targets, we actually get internally disciplined. So having done that, we, we, um, we investigated that with um, in budget estimates with the police commissioner, we pushed and poked and prodded. And then eventually we got them to A, admit they had targets and then B, to produce some of the data about what the targets are. And, when it comes to search targets, now this is not just strip searches, this is all searches. So just your regular general search, which when people have, um, when people aren't required to take off their clothing, as well as strip searches. So they're bundled together and the targets literally do your head in. And in fact, if you go back over the last five years, the police have had a target to do more than a million searches, personal searches across New South Wales in just the last five years, uh, more than a million. Um, you know, and well north of a million. And not only did they have those targets, you can see from this that they were actually, um, um, they've been going out of their way to actually meet those targets. And in, in some cases exceed the targets, including in the financial year to 2020. Um, and it's not just searches. Um, having begun this investigation about these kind of, um, we think quite um, damaging targets for proactive policing. Um, we broadened our investigation and in actual found that they found the police not only have targets for the number of searches that they do, and of course, 
strip searches are a sub subset of that. But they also have searches for other oppressive um, discretionary policing powers. And, and the, one of the most problematic is the police use of move on targets. This is the number of move on orders they issue, um, uh, most often to Aboriginal people, to homeless people, to young people in public places. And you can see that the, the targets that they've had for move ons uh, have been sitting at or above 100,000 over, um, over the last five years. Um, and you can see in 2019, the police actually exceeded their targets for the first time. They really um, um, made every effort to try and get as many move on targets, uh, move on orders as possible. I have a little bit of um, personal anim um, um, skin in the game in this because one of those 106,307 um, move on orders, well, purported move on orders, was actually directed to me. Um, and we only just beat those charges in the, the local court um, in the last fortnight or so. Um, I, I took offence at the police sending the riot squad in to move on school kids who were in a climate strike. Um, and the police took offence at me taking offence to that and then decided to prosecute me. Um, a, a bizarre waste of money, but also an appalling misuse of police powers, move on powers, trying to send the riot squad in to, to move on school kids who are, who are campaigning for a safe future. But you can see how these targets are actually driving police behaviour. And it comes about from a philosophy with no actual evidentiary base, where the police think if we keep getting in the face of young people, Aboriginal people, um, people of colour, um, um, uh, people in in overly you know overwhelmingly communities that come from lower socioeconomic parts of um, um, of our big cities and regions in particular, that they think that's going to have a um, an impact on reducing crime. Um, there is no evidence to suggest that that it has an impact on reducing crime across the board. There is one report, just one report, which the police love, that say that really aggressive move-ons and strip searches and searches can reduce, maybe, may reduce small categories of property crime by a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Um, but all of this, all of this has been driven without any evidentiary base and we know how damaging it is. So how damaging is it? Well, we're, we're talking here about a, a potential class action and legal actions against the police. Um, we have been trying for the better part of five years to get the police to tell us how much they pay in damages, how much they pay in costs, um, in order to settle claims brought against them by individuals who say that they have been falsely imprisoned after or um, uh, unlawfully searched, um, unlawfully detained. And for the last five years, the police have been saying, we'd, oh, we, we'd love to tell you, but we don't keep this data anywhere. Oh, we haven't got any things. We can't give you those categories. We can't tell you how many false imprisonment cases there are. We can't tell you how many battery and assault cases there are. We can't tell you how many abuse of power cases there are. Um, we've never believed that. And indeed, um, one of the former uh, commissioners in the Law Enforcement Conduct Commission never believed it and um, has been actively prosecuting the case and, and saying the police have an obligation to disclose in this regard. Um, very recently, we, we used the coercive powers of the New South Wales Upper House to force the police to finally release this. And what it shows is in the last 12 months, the police spent $24 million on legal settlements um, um, for cases alleging police misconduct. And, and what we also know is that's almost certainly an understatement. We've got a bunch more data um, coming out, uh, I think on the 26th of October, which we will be mining to show the true extent of the cost to taxpayers and the public of police abuse of powers. And, and if for no other reason, that figure of $24 million has been for the financial year 20 um, that's just gone, um, has been a financial year where litigation and settlements have been really impacted by COVID-19. And it almost certainly um, understates the real cost uh, to, to the New South Wales public. So the final thing I wanted to, to speak to um, was, you know, what are we doing in Parliament? I think it's absolutely essential we have accountability outside of Parliament. It's absolutely essential when we get through public health um, issues that we have large rallies coming together and, and making the case. Um, I think the Black Lives Matter movement has been extraordinarily powerful um, in this regard. Um, and I think the class actions and litigation are yet another important tool. But I think we also have an obligation to change the law. Um, and for that reason, um, we've brought some legislation. We've consulted on this over the last 12 months. Um, uh, it's, it's a proposal to change the Orwellian name Law Enforcement Powers and Responsibilities Act um, to do some 
we think essential and in some ways really modest reforms to the way in which strip searches operate. Um, um, it strictly limits strip searches to where lives are at risk, um, um, removes the ability for warrantless random searches um, um, following drug dog indications. And Sam, you'll be pleased to know, it also expressly says that you can't force people to cough, to squat, and to otherwise humiliate themselves um, in the course of strip searches. Um, so uh, we're gonna bring that bill, the current plan is to bring that bill to, um, now that we've finalized the consultation, um, to, to introduce it in its final form to Parliament in the next fortnight or so. Um, we'll of course keep everybody posted on that. We then may well refer that off to a, a parliamentary inquiry, um, but we will consult with everybody as we, as we go through those next steps. Um, so um, again, um, thanks to, to, to Redfern Legal Centre for the extraordinary work they do. The, the caseload they take on, the police complaints that they run, um, Sam, I don't know how you and your team managed to find the time to do the work you do, um, but I can say there are many of us out there um, extremely grateful um, for the work you do. Um, and, um, and we know how important that is for police accountability. Um, so it's now my job to stop speaking, hard for politicians, um, and also to hand over to Ebony Birchall from Slater and Gordon, who will take us through and give us some of that more detail about the class action and where that's up to. Um, Ebony. Thanks, David, that was great. Um, thank you to everyone for being with us today. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands where each of us are, um, and also to acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who are with us today in this webinar. Thank you for being with us. Um, I'm going to talk about the class action um, investigation that Redfern Legal Centre and Slater and Gordon are currently doing. So first I want to answer the question, what is a class action? A class action is where a group of people join together to bring a legal case. Class actions are powerful and efficient. They can allow hundreds or thousands of people um, to come together um, and take action. And it's a way for individual people to work together to stand up to huge organisations like governments or businesses, or in this case, New South Wales Police. So Sam and David have done a great job at explaining some of the problems surrounding strip search law and practice in New South Wales. So what can a class action do to help stop these unlawful strip searches? We hope this class action um, that we are investigating at the moment can be used to force New South Wales police to change their behaviour. Class actions are an important way um, to hold big institutions to account if New South Wales police perform an unlawful strip search, the law actually classifies that conduct as an assault. And this means that someone who's been, an, who's been assaulted has the right to redress and to compensation. So having hundreds of people act together is very powerful. It's the size and the impact of a class action that can change behaviour. So it means a successful class action will force New South Wales police to pay compensation to hundreds or thousands of people who have been unlawfully strip searched. And this will, having to pay this amount of compensation will make it too expensive for New South Wales police to continue doing this unlawful conduct. So that's why we're investigating um, a class action in this area. Um, we know from the statistics and the data and the material that David and Sam have just spoken about that possibly thousands of people within New South Wales have been unlawfully searched over the last six years or more. So our task now is to investigate this conduct and to work out the best way to construct a class action or a legal claim to challenge this conduct. So that's what we're doing at the moment. We're, we're doing this investigation and working out um, the most strategic way to bring this case. And in order to, for us to work that out, we really need um, your help. We need to hear from people who have been strip searched by New South Wales Police. So I'm here um, to ask you to come forward and to register with us so that we can continue our investigation. So what is it that we need you to do? Have you or your friends been searched um, by New South Wales Police? If you have, we would ask you to go to our website, 
um, to register for the class action investigation. So it's a pretty simple website. It's stripsearchclassaction.com and that will take you to a page where there's more information about exactly what we are doing. And on that page, there is a button that says, tell us your story. And we wanna hear your story because hearing your story will help us to work out the best way to run the class action. And hearing your story will mean um, that we will have the best chance of winning this, this case. So when you go to the website and click on the tell us your story button, um, it will ask you a few questions about what happened um, to you. Um, there's only about four or five questions and they're quite brief um, and you're able to fill in that form um, and send it to us. Now it's completely free um, to register and it's completely confidential. We won't use your information for anything other than this investigation. And what will happen is we will investigate over the next couple of months and work out the best way to bring litigation to challenge um, unlawful police strip searches. And at the end of our investigation, we will contact everyone who's registered with us to let them know the outcome of the investigation and we will give you information about your legal rights um, concerning what happened to you. We are asking anyone to come forward and register. Um, anyone who's been searched by New South Wales Police. Even if you're unsure whether it was a strip search, the laws, as Sam was talking about, the laws around strip searches are a little bit unclear. So um, if, even if you know, you're not sure whether what happened to you classifies as a strip search, or if you're not sure whether it was unlawful or not, that doesn't matter. We're just willing to hear from anyone who's had these experiences with New South Wales Police so that we can work out the best way to bring this class action. Um, so class actions are much easier for participants than individual litigation. Um, the participants in class actions don't face financial risks by taking part. Um, so we try and make the process as easy as possible for large groups of people. Class actions offer um, a unique opportunity to access justice in a meaningful way. So again, I would encourage you to go on to our website, stripsearchclassaction.com um, and register your details about the class action. Now, that's what I had to talk to you about, about the class action. Um, I think next we're going to move into a question and answer session um, because we're eager to hear questions from um, people who are tuning into the webinar. So I would ask um, Alexis, who's going to facilitate our question and answer um, session um, to introduce that. Yes, thank you, Ebony. Um, and as I said, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A um, if you're on the Zoom webinar and in the Facebook. Uh, if you're watching via Facebook, please post your questions there as well. Uh, David, if you want to put your camera and audio back on, if you're there. Uh, and then I can start asking some questions. Um, so first question is for Sam. Um, so the Law Enforcement Conduct Commission, which is the independent body that oversees um, the police, what someone wants to know, what do they have to say or what, um, what's been the recent activity their, their focus on strip search and what do they have to say about um, whether police are complying with the with the law? Well, uh, the Law Enforcement Conduct Commission has held a number of public hearings into strip searches, which has uh, presented some really inf interesting information. Uh, many uh, police gave evidence at these hearings. We're still waiting for the actual report to come out about strip searches in general, but there were some reports that have come out already and really what they have found is that mainly that police are not consistently applying strip search law, that uh, police officers who have had many years experience from 10 to uh, two years do not understand strip search law. Uh, they're not providing support persons for uh, children and sometimes they're not even asking the age of children to ascertain whether they are actually a child. 
A major thing also is that uh, what's come out of the hearings is that police are not recording a huge number of strip searches. And as David said, we could probably double, double at least the figures that he presented. Next question is for David, and that is um, how much political will do you think there is for change and what are some of the barriers? Well, I mean, again, this is a case where I think the parliament is miles behind the community. If, if you ask the community, do we have a problem and should we rein in police strip searches? Um, I feel, so, feel sure we'd get a, you know, a, a majority of people discomforted by the level of strip searches and say parliament should do its job and refine the law at a minimum. I think we'd have a, a very solid part of the community who's, who supports a, a much more rigorous reduction in strip searches. But, you know, we've got a police minister, a guy called David Elliott, who said he's perfectly happy for his kids to be strip searched. Um, uh, we have a quite dysfunctional conversation inside the parliament um, where too often what the police want without nuance is what both the coalition and Labor have been rushing to give them over the last 20 years. And um, that has been ratcheting up all of these laws and all of these police powers, all of the resourcing to the police. Um, but, but I do think um, um, the conversations I'm having with colleagues in the corridors, um, when, the, when the microphone's not on, um, and this is from across all political parties, are increasingly, yeah, David, there's a problem here. Yeah, we've got to do something about this. Um, uh, the question is, you know, how do we confront the police association? How do we confront um, Mick Fuller? And they readily point out that the police minister, David Elliott, is to be quite frank, a, a factional bully in the Liberal Party. And um, he's, he's a barrier to reform. So there are these distinct barriers, but there's definitely a growing awareness across politics that this is actually our job. Um, and I think my job of as a Greens MP is to push that along. That's why we've got the private members bill going. Um, and I think we might get stronger support from the community if we have a short, sharp inquiry about it. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Sam, which is, what are the top three things you would like to see change in relation to the law? David touched on some of the potential changes, but what would you say are the top three changes you would be seeking? No strip searching of, of children, uh, that you cannot consent to a strip search. Uh, the onus should be on police to conduct a strip search in the first place. And uh, that minor drug possession does not form serious and urgent circumstances to conduct a strip search. Great, thank you, Sam. And now I've got a couple of questions around the class action itself or the class action investigation for Ebony. Um, so someone's asked, if I join the class action, will my identity become public? No, your identity won't become public if you register for the class action investigation. Um, your information will be kept confidential and will only be used by Slater and Gordon and Redfern Legal Centre as part of our investigation and we won't disclose your personal information to any other party. And it, is that different um, if and when a class action itself is actually lodged in the court? Then what, what ha do to people who are class members, does their identity become public? No. Um, so what happens with class actions is there'll be, we call them a, a lead representative um, or a lead plaintiff. That'll be one person who um, will be, uh, be the, the main person, I guess, the main story that we investigate as part of the case. Um, and that person's um, name and information uh, generally will be public, um, but that is just one person and we have very lengthy conversations with that one person um, about what's involved and, and they will know what's involved before that happens. Um, but for, for the rest of the group, um, we call them group members, their identity and their information doesn't need to be made public at all and that will be kept confidential. Okay. Um, and someone's also asked, how long does a class action take? Yeah, class actions um, can take a number of years and it really 
depends on a number of factors. Um, so I can't give any sort of definitive timeframes at the moment. We're hoping that by the end of the year, we'll have a, a clear sense of how this class action will go ahead. Um, and, and we'll be able to announce by early next year what the class action will look like and who, who will be involved in the class action and who the, who will be covered by the class action. Um, and then we should be able to start the case in court and the court process um, will generally take at least two years and possibly more. Um, it really depends on, on the parties involved and um, how willing they are to settle the matter. And, and there's a number of factors that could make it last longer and that kind of thing. Obviously we do our best to, to get it resolved as quickly as possible, um, but sometimes that's out of our hands. So generally it will take a couple of years to resolve. Okay. And somebody's asked um, how much um, compensation could people expect to receive if they've been unlawfully strip searched? Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, and everybody's circumstances will be different. Um, so I, I'm not able to just give one specific amount that will cover everybody because the way that the court works out compensation claims is really by analysing what's happened to that individual person. Um, so I would hate to give any, you know, specific figure uh, now without talking to the person involved to find out what had happened with them. Um, but I can say that cases like this that have settled in the past have settled for tens of thousands of dollars. So um, it is significant um, amounts of money and particularly when you then multiply that over potentially hundreds or thousands of people. Mm, great. Um, and somebody's asked what if they're already investigating or have lodged like a, their own civil matter, how will the class action overlap with that or what should they do? Yeah, um, I mean, if you already have an individual case about an unlawful strip search that is going on at the moment, then that's fine. Um, and, you know, we're very happy for you to continue your individual claim, but it could be good for you to get in contact with us so that as our investigation and potential case um, develops, we can give you information and give your lawyers information so that, um, so that you're kept up to date with anything that happens with the class action that might impact on your individual case. Okay, and a couple more around the class action, which is, um, the first one is, do you have to be over 18 to be part of the class action? Um, yeah, you, you don't have to be over 18 to contact us. Um, if you're under 18 and you've been strip searched and you'd like our assistance, definitely get in contact. I guess I would just encourage you um, to talk with a parent or guardian if you can before contacting us because that might be helpful for you um, when contacting lawyers. But that's, uh, you know, it's really up to you. You're very welcome to contact us and we'll do what we can to help. And um, are you cut out of the class action investigation or a potential class action itself if when you were strip searched, um, drugs were actually found? Um, no, if, if you've been found with an illegal um, item, whether it's drugs or something else, that doesn't necessarily mean that the search was done lawfully. This class action is really going to look at whether or not the search was done lawfully. So um, if yeah, if there were, was an uh, unlawful object involved in the search, you should still contact us and we'll still see what we can do to help you. And, and hearing your story will still be useful for us um, while we're investigating this class action. So please do contact us. Uh, and last one is, will it cost people any money to be part of the class action? No, it, it won't cost you any money to be part of the class action. Um, the way that class actions work is that we try and make them as accessible as possible. So we're not going to ask you to pay any money up front to be part of the class action. Um, we try and work out ways for the legal costs to be paid um, at the end. You know, if the claim is successful, then that's when um, we worry about legal costs at that point and, and work it out then. But the whole idea of the class action is to make it as accessible as possible um, to all people. Okay, and so, somebody's asked, um, are you allowed to give any, any indication about how many people you've heard from or how many complaints are you looking at? Yeah, well, so 
from the data that um, David and Sam was talking about earlier, we know that um, potentially thousands of people in New South Wales have been searched over the last couple of years. So we think that the problem could be huge. Um, over the last, um, I guess it's been a couple of months now, several weeks um, since we announced this investigation, we have been contacted by hundreds of people who have been searched. So um, we have had quite a bit of contact um, and we're still obviously asking people to come forward and contact us because the more people, the better really. We're trying to um, create our own data set so that we can understand the trends and the themes in what's happening out there. And now obviously, um, you know, the New South Wales Police have much more information than we do because, you know, they have their own data set. So part of this process is for us to um, ask people to come forward and the more people, the better, the more stories we hear, the stronger our case will be. So again, I really just encourage people to, to register with us so that we can um, ensure our case is as strong as possible. Thank you. And a question for David. So I think you touched on this, but um, when will your bill be brought before Parliament and what do you think is likely to happen? Um, so our current timetable and, you know, the Parliament's agenda can be a bit fluid, um, depending on what's happening. Um, as we're talking, the, the John Barillaro, the Deputy Premier, is apparently threatening to blow up the coalition, so who knows. But our current, um, um, he does that every second day, by the way. Um, the current timetable is the 23rd of September um, for the introduction. Um, and that I'd give it an initial read. And then the intent would be to put it to a, a, a committee to have an inquiry over the summer break um and to then come back early next year with the benefit of that committee and that report so um it would be lovely if we could have a class action sort of kicking along at the same time to put yeah. that additional pressure on on decision makers and what can members of the public do to get involved and have their say well on the assumption well there are two things one is we we're looking to see if we can get an e-petition together um, in support of the bill. Um, getting e-petitions in the New South Wales Parliament has been a little pet project of mine, moving the Parliament from the 19th to the 21st century in, um, in, in just a matter of months. So uh, hopefully we'll have that ready to roll by, by, by the end of this month. Um, so we'll be looking to have e-petitions. Um, and then of course, if it goes to a committee, um, actually getting people to put you know, uh, put those submissions in and show their support. And, and of course, always contact your local member. Say, what are they doing? Why aren't they fixing it as well? Great. Um, and Ebony, another one for you. Someone's asked if they can register if they live outside of New South Wales or is this limited to New South Wales? Yeah, so obviously the class action um, we're investigating is against New South Wales Police um, and is looking specifically at New South Wales Police conduct. So um, it could be that, you know, someone who lives in Victoria had travelled to New South Wales for a music festival or something like that. And, and if the search happened in New South Wales and was, you know, done by the New South Wales Police, then definitely get in contact. It doesn't matter that you're now in a different state. Um, but I guess the important factor is the search had to have been done by New South Wales Police. And how long ago could it have happened? Like, does it have to have happened in the last year or so? Yeah, there, there are some time limits in the law. Um, and it's usually, you have usually about six years to bring a claim um, in, in these sort of circumstances. So we're sort of focusing on that six year period. So, you know, anywhere from 2014 up till this year. Um, but if you, if you did have um, one of these police searches occur prior to 2014, um, you're still welcome to contact us and register um, because if we can help you um, act on your legal rights in any way, then we will. Um, so we can look into whether or not there's anything we can do for people who have been searched earlier than 2014. Great. And somebody's asked, um, probably this one's for you, Sam, what are some tips if you're um, approached by police who want to conduct a strip search on you? Yeah, thanks, Alexis. Uh, it's always very difficult uh, speaking up uh, to police. It's very easy for me here to tell people what to do, but it's very intimidating. But there are some tips that I give people. Uh, if anything, if the only thing you can do is say to them that you don't consent, just say you don't consent, then that's really important for later on when uh, contesting either a criminal or civil matter. 
ask them to turn on their body worn video footage and have the actual subject of that that practice recorded uh, and you can take someone with you under the act uh, if you are being strip searched you can actually ask to have a, a person with you if you're injured then I advise you to take photos of your inju injuries uh, I don't know why I can't get my words out today straight away uh, and to go to a doctor as soon as possible so they're just some quick tips. It's very traumatic. I advise you to go seek some legal advice as soon as you can and to write down the date and time that it happened. Thanks, Sam. And so you mentioned you should try and you, to explain to police that you don't consent to the search and maybe get that written down or recorded. Um, but should you uh, cooperate with the strip search? Look, it's always best to be cooperative because things can escalate and get worse usually for the person that is being searched. So we say yes, say that you don't consent and be cooperative. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and another question for Ebony, which is if you're of a particular gender or you identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, do you have um, staff of particular genders or races that you can that you can request to talk to? Yeah, so we appreciate that talking about um, circumstances like this can be traumatic and difficult. So we want to do everything we can to make um, this investigation process as easy as possible as it for people who have been searched and have gone through these often traumatic um, events. So um, yes, you can ask to speak with someone of a specific gender um, or someone um, from an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background. And um, part of the registration form that's on the website will actually ask you if you would like um, to speak with someone of a specific gender or, or background. Um, and we will try, we can try and do as much of our contact via email um, as possible if that makes it easier so you don't have to do phone calls. Um, we're very happy to help as best we can to make the process as, as easy as, as possible. Yeah, which I think links into this other question, which is what if you want to help the class action, but you don't really want to speak to anyone about what's happened? Yeah, and I mean, Basically what I've just said, we, we totally understand that talking about these events can be traumatic. Um, you know, I even spoke with someone recently who contacted us who told us that they'd never spoken to any of their friends or family about what happened, but they wanted um, to let us know because they wanted to help the investigation, which is lovely. Um, so I appreciate it. it's difficult and trying. So as lawyers, we're going to try and do as best we can to make it as easy as possible. So again, if, if that means um, communicating via email or text message or um, WhatsApp or Facebook rather than on phone calls um, or yes, by arranging a specific gender or, or racial background to speak with you, then we can do that. Great. Thank you, Ebony. Um, well, it's coming very close to three o'clock now. So I'd like to um, say to everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you've learned a lot. We hope that you'll speak up and get involved in the movement for change. Um, and if you've been affected, we hope that you'll register for the class action investigation at stripsearchclassaction.com. Thank you very much for your time to all the speakers. And um, I'll sign off now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alexis. And okay. thanks, everyone. Cool.